Hello everyone and welcome back to the NPC Dungeon. I am your host and Game Master for the time being as always. And some of you may know that I released an episode a couple weeks ago about immersing your players into the game. I got into some of the more pedantic kinds of things you can do, but I avoided the big stuff. As promised, I'm going to return to that topic this week and this time I'm going to follow last week's example and really go in depth, zooming in on one aspect of this concept. I'm covering what I probably should have started with. It's probably the most important and most potent tool you have at your disposal when trying to make your games more immersive. And that is doing whatever you can to make your campaign more character driven, so let's learn something. First, let's start with what I mean when I say character driven. So, what do I mean when I say character driven? Well, let's look at what a character driven story is. It's a story whose characters drive the action forward. Usually, we're referring to the main character when we say this, but in D&D and other tabletop games, you have multiple characters. And instead of things just happening around the character or characters or happening to the character or characters, the character has agency and they are the one making things happen. In fact, a good way to see if a story is character driven is to ask if you took the character out, would the story still be possible? If yes, then it isn't character driven. If not, then it is. You see, in a character-driven story, the character is essential to the plot. At this point, you may be wondering what I'm doing talking about stories and not D&D. Well, this style of writing does something very important that we as DMs can learn from. What it does is it allows the reader to have someone to attach themselves to and to anchor themselves to as they read, and it gives them a kind of emotional lens through which to see the story. In short, it immerses them in it. Now, I want to go ahead and say for stories, character-driven doesn't always mean better, and for some stories, it may not even work. And there are certainly groups out there that you could say the same for with D&D. Not all players care if their actions move the story forward, and that's fine. But for those of us who do, and for those of us, myself included, who want to be immersed, what can we do as DMs and GMs to enable that experience? Well, I already mentioned a few general principles before in my last episode on immersion, and I'm going to kind of bring them full circle here before going on to the main point of today's episode. And these two even kind of go hand in hand and lead up to this main point. And those two points are making your world interactive and providing effects and consequences for your players' actions in the game. They both involve the characters being the ones driving things forward and making decisions and having agency, and we're going to start with making the world interactive. I'm going to try to keep this point kind of short and sweet. The shortest and simplest thing that I like to do is add lots of descriptions to things. That's the easiest part, and it goes a long way. Sure, your players may not need it all, but I'll give you an example and let you judge for yourself. Your players come upon a cave. You could just say, you see a cave peeking out from the hillside. Or you could say, as you wade through the forested underbrush, kicking off leaves and mud from the undersides of your boots, you see a gaping spot punched into the side of the hill before you. A cave in which you can barely see, even with the sparse sunlight as it pierces in between the shadowy canopies of the trees hanging overhead. Not only does it give the players an image to keep in their heads, but it also gives them other details they can work with. Oh, there are trees. One may decide to climb a tree later on if they deem it necessary. But this idea isn't just limited to description. Let's say your players are in a tavern. What things can you put in the tavern that your players can actually do? There might very well be a group of people playing a board game in the corner. There could be a couple sitting at a nearby table talking about the world's politics. Maybe someone is drunkenly stumbling through the bar, and the list goes on. I challenge you to Pick a location, think up any location you want, and think of a few interactive things you could populate it with. I'll even give you a few locations for inspiration. Maybe your players are in a royal ballroom, an old library, a graveyard, or some old ruins. There are many, many more that you can choose from, of course, so pick one of those or use your own. Maybe even one that you're stuck on for your own campaign. Then, I want you to come up with a few things that your potential players could do there. Maybe three if you want, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. Just try it. You'll surprise yourself. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, feel free to share your ideas in the comments if you want. And when you actually do this for a campaign, bonus points if at least one of your ideas is related to the story in some way. The more you do this, the more you practice this, the more adding these little things like this will become second nature to you. When you make a new location, you'll start doing this without even realizing this. But this method extends beyond just locations. The same idea applies to your NPCs, your encounters, your stories, and again the list goes on. For an NPC, what might your players want to do with them or talk to them about? For your encounters, what parts of your encounters are interactive and why? But for more encounters, check out my episode on how I structure interesting and engaging encounters. And lastly, for your stories, when do your players have opportunities to majorly change the trajectory of the story? This idea permeates everything you might want to do to make your game interactive, from little details to big, large-scale sweeping ideas, and it even leads nicely to my next point. So 
So you have these interactive things, and this is kind of your fuel, but this fuel doesn't really burn well without consequences. And by consequences, I don't necessarily mean bad things. Sure, sometimes they will be, but I'm just referring to the effects that come from your player's actions. I know I've said this on the show before. I believe it was on my episode on adventure hooks. If you haven't checked that out, feel free to do so now. But if your players are going through the world and their actions don't bring about any change, how can they be motivated to do anything? And I'd like to add here that if they're not motivated to do anything, how can they drive the story forward at all? And I've already established that allowing your players to really drive the story forward is a major step in making your game more character driven, which actually helps your players feel more immersed, at least it does for me. Okay, cool. But what kind of tips can I give you to help you do this? Well, one very specific way is by setting up choices that your players have to make. Maybe they don't have enough time to rescue both the prince and attack the dwarven stronghold, so they have to choose. I'd like to note here, though, that they might find a way to do both, and if it would work, I say awesome. But if they don't, the one they don't have time to do will probably end up pretty badly for them and lead to future arcs and adventures. I'd also like to note that you should only do this if you're okay with either route. If you need one thing to happen, don't present them both at the same time like this. Just do one and save the other for later. Remember, you can reorganize like this because you're the one making it, but just like I said in my last episode of helping the game run more smoothly as a DM, make sure you do this before it actually happens. Don't take something back after your players have already done it and made the decision. At that point, it's up to you to be creative and find a way to rein it in. Again, this is exactly why we plan. But this also applies to decisions that your players just make, even ones that you didn't actually force. Big plot related decisions are the easiest to imagine, so let's start with those. Let's say your players just let the big bad guy get away or gave into their demands and gave them what they wanted. What's the bad guy doing now? Or maybe they did something good and defeated one of the bad guy's henchmen or stole an important weapon from them. But this obviously depends on your story in particular, so I want to give you a few guidelines for when planning for these consequences. For one thing, don't just be mean and punish your players, especially if they did something that ended well. Obviously, as a general rule, you don't just want to punish your players anyway, but to give an example, if they say just saved the king of some kingdom, it's generally a bad idea to just randomly say, aha, you saved the king, but he was a changeling the whole time. He was the bad guy. Now he's going to try to kill you. Again, there are stories in which that works, but if you're not running that kind of story, that kind of thing will probably just end up causing more problems than it will solve. Here's a good rule of thumb. If you're not doing it to intentionally get back at or punish your players or anything, then you're probably fine. Just get feedback from them and see what they think afterward. It's a learning process. Just know that the kind of plots that involve those kinds of things happening generally take a lot of skill to pull off. But like I said, not all consequences have to be big pre-planned plot stuff. For example, my players once left an NPC they, they liked behind. The conditions were right, so the NPC got kidnapped. The same goes for stolen items, forgotten quest lines, and other decisions that you can think of. But that's enough of that. I've waited long enough, so now it's time to get to the main point of today's episode, and that's using your players' backstories. This point may not end up being as long as I intended it to be, but I have a lot packed into it, and it's a very potent idea, and I'm going to start it with some of my experience. So, my first couple of campaigns that I ever ran, as most people's do, didn't take this simple rule into account. I just made a story, and my players were there in it. I didn't think about or collect backstories. Then, I realized that if they had a story, if they had a backstory for their character, they might feel a little bit more like part of the world, and be more likely to do things. But it didn't go very far. At this point, I had a world, I had a story, and their backstory stories kind of came into play a little bit, but I was just kind of injecting them into the story. My story was prior to their backstories. And real quick note, as I said, this point does draw from some of my experience and progress as a DM, so if you're interested in that, feel free to check out my episode on how I structure interesting and engaging encounters. I talk a little more about that there, but back to the matter at hand and back to the present day. I'm running two campaigns right now because I hate myself, the first of which I already had long before I had my players' characters. This is because I was planning on running it for this group months prior, but that didn't end up happening, so I had to shelf it for a while until I I finally ended up getting the chance to run it. Either way, once I did get their characters, I took some time to use what they gave me to craft their introductions into the campaign and to each other, with their help of course. I used what motivated the characters to drive their entrance into the story. That way, they had inbuilt goals and directions from the very beginning. Now obviously, I already had this campaign pretty much previously prepared, so I was able to use all of this to work the backstories into it, and you can do this if you need to, after all, as I keep saying, you are the architect, so you have the power to change things that do not yet directly involve your players. For example, if your plot involves an evil scientist trying to create a powerful monster, and one of your players is a druid or a barbarian who was once exiled from their tribe, maybe part of their tribe, or someone important, was gathering resources for the main bad guy. Obviously, it should probably be a little more subtle than this, but all that depends on your story and your players and the kind of game you all want to run and play in in specific. However, I don't want to spend too much time on that, on working things into your campaign in particular, because while yes, you will in all likelihood spend some time working things into the campaign, it's probably a little better, at least in the case of backstories, to have in 
in most cases, your players' backstories worked into the campaign from day one. My other campaign that I'm running right now does this. I had an idea of what I wanted to happen for the story before I had the characters, because I already had a one-off plan and I want to build off of that, but I tried not to plan too much for this campaign in particular, or get too specific with it in particular, until they made their characters. I did it this way so that I could intertwine their backstories inescapably with the story itself, so I didn't have to worry about being able to work them into the story. I didn't have to inject them into the story. And I'll be honest, that's another trick that I kind of picked up from watching Dimension 20. It's a trick that Brennan Lee Mulligan uses that I would have probably taken a bit long to find myself had I not seen him use it. And I'm realizing as I say this that you could probably make a story and work your players into it, like I said before, but it would very likely be very hard to make it not feel disjointed, at least in some way. All in all, it's easier just to work them into it from the beginning. Obviously, like I already said, there are some groups and tables where this isn't the norm and where you just don't want to do this and your players don't really care that much about immersion, and that's fine. This may not apply to you. I still encourage you to try it, try new things, try new styles, see what works for you. But if it doesn't, fine, ignore me. But for those of you who are still listening, first of all, thank you. Second of all, let's take stock of what we have. All right, cool. So now you have a story where your players' backstories are intermingled with the main plotline of the campaign. That's great. But remember, in general, I realize every group is a little bit different, but in general, if you want your players to really feel immersed and really start just getting in there and driving the story forward, then you need them to have conflict. They need to have a reason to be moving forward. Maybe some tragedy befalls your characters on an individual level, or they get an opportunity they've been waiting for. This is where a good, decent working knowledge of story structure comes in. And in my next campaign I run, I'm going to experiment with that a little bit. And don't worry, as I plan for that, and as I brainstorm for it, I'm going to probably make a few episodes, not just for you guys, but to help myself a little bit as I work on injecting and putting story structure into my D&D campaigns. More so than I already do at least. But for this week, that's it for this week's Game Advice episode. If you haven't checked out my story for this week, I recommend it. It's the last bonk story for now. As always, I upload new episodes on Friday, so feel free to come back next Friday where I tell a story that I mentioned in my episode on the problem with side quests that I didn't tell in full. It follows the introduction of a truly unforgettable character, so be on the lookout for it. I'll also go back to how I helped the game run a little bit more smoothly from the DM's perspective, this time from the lens of how my three-part encounter structure can help you identify where an encounter may be falling a little flat and what you can do to help that. I'll also be trying out something a little bit new next Friday. I've realized that listening to a whole 20 minute or so long episode on YouTube may not be ideal for some of you, so I'm going to start breaking my DM advice episodes into two parts. Don't worry, I'll still publish both parts of each DM advice episode on YouTube in that same week, the same week that the episode is going to be released on podcast platforms as one episode. To repeat, all of my episodes will be still released evenly, so there will not be any kind of unbalance, and you'll be getting the same stuff no matter what you listen to. This is just so that it's more digestible on YouTube. So this means you'll be getting two episodes on pretty much whatever podcast platform you listen to as usual per week and three on YouTube. All the same content though. My D&D story episodes will still be in one piece as they are usually shorter unless I end up publishing a really long one one day or something like that. Also, if you haven't noticed, I did also go ahead and relabel all of my D&D story episodes D&D story instead of just story. And one last announcement. I'm thinking about splitting up when I publish my DM advice episodes and my D&D story episodes. My DM advice episodes will all probably be on the same day so no about that, but I am considering releasing my DM advice episodes on Fridays and my DD story episodes on Tuesdays. I repeat though, they are still all on Fridays for right now. I'm just thinking about this. I may not, but I just thought I'd mention it. If you're listening to this on YouTube, as always, feel free to comment, let me know what you think. And as always, until next time, let's learn something.